uh, check the exam, so we'll continue and I'll hand it uh, back Tuesday, and we can discuss on the questions uh, on Tuesday. Then. And the other thing is, uh, since I posted the homeworks pretty much, uh, uh, it's kind of, you, you had it available yesterday, so, uh, so instead of office hours today, I'm proposing tomorrow. So if you have uh, tomorrow, I'll be around basically five till seven in my office. So uh, if you uh, get started in the homework or you want to discuss further concepts, uh, um, come by. So instead of today, uh, we do it tomorrow. And uh, uh, if you uh, do want to meet today, uh, drop me an email. I'll uh, see I can uh, rearrange my schedule a little bit. Okay. So, um, all right. <coughs> Let me somehow. OK, good. So um, what I'll uh, do uh, start with today is is uh, uh, so this is uh, this is an exa uh, not exam but a homework question for you uh, of of uh, um, about a pretty remarkable thing that uh, electrons can do uh, which is uh, they can uh, tunnel through uh, potential barriers and uh, 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 this uh, problem essentially is uh, posed in a way that. Uh, um, th 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 there's an uh, electron that's sitting uh, inside a, a, a quantum well or a quantum dot, if you might. Typically, it's a quantum dot. And uh, uh, then it has a potential barrier. This can be the, con uh, not can be, this is the conduction band of a semiconductor. Right? Uh, here you have a very wide band gap insulator. Conduction band is there. And then out here, you have uh, a conduction band uh, of the material is here. So, and uh, this is a barrier because this is the band gap of the material. Those energies are not allowed. Okay? So that's why this is like a potential barrier for the electron. And the question uh, that is being asked is, uh, if you put an electron, so here's a uh, um, situation where you, this is one of the allowed energies for the electron, and you put it there. And uh, uh, so you, you can find out it, it uh, actually, even though this electron in classical mechanics will sit there forever because it cannot go, go across the barrier, right? But uh, because uh, electrons have wave-like nature, because they are quantum mechanical particles, uh, there's a finite lifetime. It will leak out, ultimately. So, and uh, we, uh, we'll develop today, how do you calculate those things? How, how long will it stay there? And that's what I'm asking in this question. How long does it stay there if you just put it like that, right? And then you can go in with a... Uh, voltage or a battery and apply a small voltage here, pull the conduction band down by maybe uh, 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 half an electron volt or something with 0.5 volts. And then uh, you can show that this time for the electron to leak out can go from, say, you know, a few years to uh, maybe a millisecond or something like that. You can kind of, so, so, so this is the basis for the memory, the flash memory that uh, you know is in your solid state drives in all computers and all that now. So, so typically, this could be a metal or a floating gate. This is a insulating or wide band gap semiconductor or an insulator, and this is a semiconductor, and you're kind of moving them back and forth. Uh, uh, so, if you have the electron sitting there, that can be a one, and if you don't have an electron there, that's a zero. So, that's kind of the zeros and ones. Yeah. Very good point, yeah. So uh, the, uh, uh, your question is uh, whether they feel exchange interaction. Uh, now, exchange uh, would be related to the spin of the electrons. Uh, and uh, so that's a spin-spin repulsion. And uh, typically, these wells are nanometers apart. You know? so, so by that time, the exchange interaction is uh, completely you know, <coughs> dead. Basically, it, it's very short range. But what they do see is the Coulomb interaction, you know, uh, the, just the pure classical Coulomb interaction or repulsion that they do see. And that's something one has to work with uh, uh, when you place the, these are typically dots, so they are, you know, when you place them, you don't want them to talk to each other. You want them to be completely independent. And so each one is a bit, you know, zero is one. So, so you don't want them to cross talk. And the design, in the design, you keep them far apart that. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, um, kind of, uh, uh, and, and th this is just uh, one of the situations where uh, you will 
uh, see this uh, effect. Uh, um, and uh, let me, uh, instead of uh, uh, maybe just to motivate it, uh, here here's a picture of, of uh, how uh, this phenomena is called tunneling, uh, quantum mechanical tunneling. And uh, uh, really, it is. Uh, uh, one of the genuine proofs that electrons are indeed uh, um, have wave-like nature, and uh, and, and the, uh, it has fascinated people who who, who were you know, founders of uh, quantum mechanics back in 22. Uh, if you're uh, looking at electrons moving out of a metal in vacuum when you apply a voltage, that's field emission, and that's also a tunneling process. So all the physics of what we're going to cover in a semiconductor is the same as ionizing an electron with a high electric field, uh, in, you know, uh, ionizing an atom with a high electric field, or you know, alpha decay uh, in, 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 in uh, high energy physics or radioactivity. It's all the same. Radioactivity is also a tunneling phenomena and, and, and all that sort of thing. So it's you know, interested and fascinated people for a very long time. In solid state or physics of, you know, in uh, semiconductors and nanostructures, uh, the way we use tunneling are in tunneling diodes and ohmic contacts resonant tunneling diodes, quantum cascade lasers, and you know, that sort of thing. That, those are the places where these uh, structures are used. And uh, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, for example, Nobel Prize winners uh, who have discovered tunneling in various forms uh, over, the, over, over the ages. And I'm pretty sure there's more to come. So uh, here's an example. I, before we go through the uh, you know, physics, uh, here's an example of something we do in our laboratory, for example, here. Uh, we grow these materials in Duffield Hall. And essentially, what we do here is uh, we have electrons moving in the conduction band of a semiconductor. And then in, in its path, we put two barriers. So here's a you know, two nanometer, roughly one point some nanometer barriers. This is the conduction band profile. Instead of one barrier in the memory, you have two now. You know. And the electron comes along. And uh, it can actually, even though classically it's forbidden for electron to go this way, uh, because of the barrier, uh, if you kind of resonate at the same energies as this, uh, then you can go through, and the current that you measure flowing across here, you will see a peak as it resonates. You know? so, so there's a peak, and that's uh, 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 and then the current actually goes down after that when you increase the voltage further. So the, you get a region of negative resi differential resistance. Di by dV is negative. You know? So so. Increasing the voltage, but the current is decreasing. You know, so that's kind of uh, strange. And so uh, uh, now, uh, th when you pull down this potential barrier further with a little more voltage, then you resonate with the second level and third level, and you can kind of start measuring each of these. Now, this is not, you know, some fancy low temperature phenomena. It is really uh, you can measure this at room temperature. You know, it's all very, very uh, solid uh, effect. And when you come in and bias it, for example, if you try to uh, push a current through it, which is roughly around this value, uh, then the voltage uh, is unstable. You can see it has three voltage, voltages possible. So if you kind of bias it at that point, at, you know, inject that much current, the voltage across it starts oscillating because it, it's unstable. And this is how, this is one of the ways where you can create from a DC power, you can create AC power. You, you, you input, you know, DC voltage, but output is RF, or high frequency oscillation power, you know. Yeah? Because you're applying a field that's not sensitive to carrier freeze out then, low temperature? Uh, so I see a good question. So these are uh, the carrier supply for this transport is uh, determined by how much supply of electrons you have here. And tunneling has, is pretty much almost independent of temperature. Uh, tunneling, uh, we'll, we'll see why. The only thing that affects temperature effects is occupation function of the K states here. You know. If you have very light doping here, you know, uh, and you lower the temperature, you'll freeze those carriers. If, if you have heavy doping, the Fermi level is kind of in, in, almost in the conduction band, then the temperature has very small effect on it. Right? Now, uh, what temperature does affect is the distribution of carriers in the conduction band, the Fermi function. It, that's the, and, and all these little details you can explain by the change of the Fermi function in, in this measurement. Yeah? Maybe I misunderstood, but when it says a tunneling oscillator, what you're saying is that you get that effect because <coughs> of the fact that you have three voltages for a given forced current. It's oscillating between those voltages? Uh, an oscillator, yeah. So whenever I, input some DC effect and out comes a time-dependent oscillation. It's called an oscillator in general. That's the word for it, right? So 
And, and here, uh, this oscillation is because of tunneling. That's just, are you bothered by the name or the phenomena I'm itself? I'm wondering, yeah. is it something that has a fixed frequency that is oscillating oh. between those voltages? Or Good point, yeah. No, the frequency you completely determine by, uh, uh, so the, it has a frequency limit, and the frequency limit is the electron, you know, uh, this is a f kind of fabry perot cavity for the electron, and that determines the limit, the lifetime of the electron inside that. That is an upper limit. But typically, these devices can generate uh, power at very, very high frequencies. What, what stops it from doing it is all the external, you have to connect it with external inductors or capacitors and all that. That's what limits the speeds of these devices, typically. You know? But uh, the frequency uh, of, uh, example, resonant tunneling oscillators, you can reach uh, you know, um, 500 gigahertz, 400 gigahertz, and that's a very high frequency oscillator. So, right, OK. So uh, I, just an example, uh, uh, and, and uh, very similar phenomena if you have many of these barriers uh, you know, precisely tuned and designed. Uh, you can have electron inject, tunnel through, then drop, uh, and then tunnel through, drop, and in every drop it emits a little photon, you know, one photon, it will emit a photon. And when it does, does that, that's what's called a quantum cascade laser. Uh, so it's a unipolar laser where every tunnel and then drop, it emits a photon. Yeah. Um, what is NDR? Yeah, NDR is a, a negative differential resistance. So it's, it's a phenomena which is DI by DV. This is a normal resistance, you know, DI by DV is positive or conductance. And here it's negative, though. So, so that's negative differential resistance. And whenever you have negative differential resistance and you bias it at that point, you will oscillate. I mean, this is a typical, you know, situation. You can oscillate it. Okay. So uh, that's for inter. Uh, this sort of uh, tunneling you can see is going on inside the conduction band. This is the conduction band, and there's a gap here which is not shown. But the, so electrons are always in the conduction band in in this situation. But uh, uh, another form of tunneling is, is when you have interband tunneling, where you start from the valence band and you, uh, you know, come out into the conduction band. That's the interband tunneling. I had referred to it earlier too sometimes. You know. uh, and uh, uh, typically, if you take a semiconductor and you apply a very large voltage or a very large electric field across it, the bands kind of bend that way. And then the electrons have a finite probability of uh, making it through the barrier, and now the barrier is the whole of the band gap. The whole band gap is the barrier, and it has a finite probability of getting out on the other side. Uh, and uh, in, uh, you can increase the probability by increasing the field, making a PN junction. This is a PN junction where this side is P-type, this side is N-type. There is a built-in field already. You don't have to apply that externally. And then you apply a little bit field, and then you can start tunneling them. And, and, and you know this is called interband. You can see it's different because uh, electrons are transitioning from the valence band, for example, to another, to the conduction band, to the next higher band. And, uh, 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 and, and, and this effect, uh, uh, what I want to do is develop a strategy to calculate the current for such a situation. And so we have not yet done that in this course, so we are going to do that now. Okay, so uh, uh, let's uh, uh, look at this problem, and I'm going to, uh, again, one can go pretty deep into the subject, but I'm going to give you uh, one method which is, uh, I think, actually intuitively very appealing and it does not require, you know, it requires a little bit of work, but not too much. You know. so, so we'll start with that sort of a picture. Uh, so uh, uh, what we are really looking at uh, is, is uh, this situation that I have, uh, uh, you know, an uh, electron that's uh, uh, moving in, uh, in, in a certain direction. And it encounters perhaps a potential barrier that may like look something like that. You know. And this is uh, for a semiconductor. This this is uh, uh, your uh, you can call it a, as your conduction band at any point x, right? And uh, uh, and and um, you know, let's say somehow here I have put in a heterostructure or something like that, and I have a little taller barrier than before. Right? Now, uh, uh, these, uh, uh, so the electron energy we're going to label as above. And uh, this is for, the, for any semiconductor. I'll write it as the conduction band. But it can be in the valence band. It can be in any band, right? So it doesn't have to be the conduction band. And instead of writing EC of x, I'm going to just make it a little more general and write the, this profile as the potential profile. It's like a classical mechanics problem, you know? So you're throwing a ball, and there's a wall, right? 
and this is the potential, uh, right? so, so something like that. And uh, <coughs> so there are two quantities. There's the en kinetic energy, which gives it, you know, how much above the potential uh, minima are you? And, uh, uh, and, and then there's obviously the potential energy V, which is, uh, so instead of writing EC of X, let's just deal with V of X. And this is really the, uh, the most basic uh, uh, pro uh, you know, uh, Schrodinger problem where you're solving this uh, uh, d2 by dx squared plus v of x, right, A, uh, times the wave function at any point x is equal to e psi. That, that, that's really, you, you, this is this, uh, you know, uh, solving the Schrodinger equation will give you what is your wave function at any point x. You can do mod square, find out what's the probability of finding that electron at that point, right? So, so this, uh, uh, we, are, we are really solving this problem, which is the first thing you do in, 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 a, in a quantum mechanical uh, uh, solution, right? But uh, here, uh, for the tunneling problem, uh, we are asking this question, that I have an incident, electron incident from this side, let's call it, it has a wave function of psi left at some point x. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then there's a, we're saying there's a finite probability that that electron is going to come out on this side. And we'll call it psi r of x is the wave function uh, of, on the right side. Right? And so the tunneling probability uh, will be, uh, at least you can see this is uh, uh, um, intuitively hopefully correct that uh, the probability of finding it on the right side is this over probability of finding it on the left side is that right uh, so so that that uh, you know because that's the probability and that's how you know uh, we define tunneling probability you can make it very precise by saying that i have an incident wave i have a small reflection and on the right side i only have a transmission and you can calculate it what is the mod t squared you know this is basically a boundary matching problem and all that uh, but I'm going to kind of uh, uh, give you a very general solution of this, for, and then we're just going to apply it. And this general solution is the, uh, you know, after the people who started it, it's called the WKB solution <coughs> uh, of the Wenzel, Kramers, and uh, Brillouin, who, who, who uh, developed this first. But in fact, before them, it was uh, Green, George Green, as in the Green's function person, uh, had kind of already given roughly the solution of this problem. It's a general class of solutions whenever you have a differential equation like this. What is, and your V of X is changing, right? You have a barrier or you have a well or something like that. What happens to your energies? What happens to your wave functions? And so so. so uh, uh, the, the, so the way that we kind of go about, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna solve it. I'm gonna just recast it in a slightly different way. This equation, you rewrite it as, uh, you know, uh, a standard looking uh, differential equation with uh, two mass, uh, and then you get uh, over h bar squared, right? Uh, and uh, I get, uh, so if I take minus v of x minus e, right? So. Right, that's uh, your. Uh, <coughs> right. Uh, so, so this quantity uh, we can call it as Q of x, right? And uh, it's it's. Uh, uh, you can see that uh, if if uh, the right hand side was not varying with space, if Q of x was not, if, if potential was flat, it's trivial. It's an easy solution, right? It's uh, you know, and and if if uh, if this quantity is negative. Physically, that means that the kinetic energy or the energy E is larger than V of X. In that case, this thing is negative, and your psi is oscillatory. It's just you know d, d2 of a function is by dx square is negative of that function, right? So you get e to the power i kx and e to the power i, uh, you know minus i kx are sines and cosines. Right? It's an oscillatory function, and so indeed in this region you will get uh, an oscillatory uh, solution for the side of, on the left side, right? it will just oscillate, right? If it's flat. Now, uh, if it is changing, but it's changing very slowly, it's changing very slowly, yes, right? I mean, and this is a typical situation in a band diagram in a semiconductor. You will have some potential drop and all that. I just showed you the resonant tunneling doubt, the potential was kind of changing as you went to the left side. 
in which case uh, this uh, uh, you know um, uh, the solution would be a little more involved and and uh, that that's essentially what WKV gives you it says that if you write it in this way the solution uh, for this equation for a slowly varying potential Q uh, will look uh, like e to the power um, let me just write it down and then uh, over Q of X to the power one fourth. You know? So so times some constant. So uh, uh, and then this is really the uh, uh, WKB solution right? to 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 the, any equation where d2 psi by d squared is q times x. For our case of interest, that happens to be the Schrodinger equation. It, it could be Maxwell, it could be any equation, classical mechanics equation, whatever. And, but, but this is the WKB solution for, uh, for this general set of equations. Okay. And uh, um, for, for us, uh, the uh, WKB solution now, uh, look uh, again, so how does it look? It's basically saying that it, your solution is uh, e to the power plus or minus depending upon which direction you're going uh, times uh, it's a function of x and there's an x here and this is the x here local q of x is just a uh, potential minus uh, e so, times the constants in front you know 2m by h bar squared so uh, uh, so f uh, physically you can see now right away that uh, uh, if the kinetic energy is lower than the barrier height right if, if the kinetic energy is uh, uh, lower than the barrier height, then Q of X is po positive, right? Q of X is positive, and therefore, uh, you have, uh, instead of complex exponential, so let's see, write it this way, Q of X is negative, implies the solutions go as e to the power plus minus I times some K and some X. It's an oscillatory function, sines or cosines. But Q of X is positive, implies the wave function goes as e to the power plus or minus some real number times x, right? Some real number times x. And, and uh, this real number kappa would be kind of the uh, decay constant or penetration, uh, inverse of the penetration depth because of tunneling and that sort of thing. So, so, uh, <coughs> uh, so, so by basically taking this uh, picture and, and uh, applying this to the situation, what we get is uh, we are going to start by saying that uh, already, you know, I kind of know the solution here, it's oscillating, but then I'm very interested in finding out what is the probability of a, you know, I'm, I'm interested in finding out what is psi on the right side, maybe just here, divided by what psi squared on the left side just here. That's the tunneling probability. So what, to do that, what I'll do is I'll integrate it from A to B, where, you know, this point is A, and that point is B. Right. Does that make sense? That, 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 that's what I'm going to do. And you can see kind of what, what I'm trying to do is, uh, uh, let me write it this way. And if uh, this is an approximation, so uh, is, is going to be uh, psi right, which kind of is at x is equal to B, if you might, or B plus, just to the right of B over psi left, x is equal to a minus just to the left of a, just to the left of a. And uh, what I'm claiming now is uh, uh, there's a denominator factor which is changing very slowly. You can include it. I'm going to actually not bother about it at this point. I'm going to just go with the numerator here. And uh, I want to write it down as uh, uh, this, fu this function. It's, it's going to be e to the power minus, and it's a square. So there'll be a two out here, and okay. So that's how it's going to look. Again, uh, in the spirit of, uh, I, I said that there's uh, some constants out in the front, but this is of the order of unity maybe 0.9 or 1.1 or something. I'm throwing that out. There's something in the front, but not considering it. Uh, the major factor is this one, the exponential factor, right? So, so, then. so uh, this will be the uh, tunneling probability when, uh, when the uh, electron comes out on the right. And essentially, you can see what we have done is uh, 
you know, you, you can have your potential in any shape here, v of x. Uh, and uh, uh, what, what is actually inside that integral physically is v of x minus e, where e is the electron energy. So v of x minus e is this quantity, right? right? So what you're doing there is you're integrating out this area, right? This area that I'm trying to shade right now. V of x minus e, taking a square root with some constant and putting it in the exponential. So that's really what you're physically doing. So, so that's how you kind of a general method of evaluating turning probability. You know? I didn't derive all the results, but to, told you that this is where it comes from. It's, yeah. And which is a direct application of this one. Yeah. yeah. Why are you denoting B plus and A minus? Yeah. So, uh, so actually, let me just say that uh, very close to these two, uh, uh, what I call as classical turning points, the mathematical things kind of have a little complications. You know? So I'm going to move out to the right and go to the left. Um, but then we're taking advantage of the fact that if it's an oscillatory function, mod psi square is one, you know, e to the power i k x, you take mod psi is one, it doesn't quite change, you know, so you kind of take advantage of that little, you know, stuff where it's well behaved, little stuff here is well behaved, but nearby there's uh, some complications, I'm trying to skip it, you know, so, yeah. But you can get into that and look into more details of it. I'm not going to change anything we, you know, have discussed till now. Uh, Okay, so now, now we're going to basically apply it then to uh, a situation of interband tunneling. You can do it within the same band, but I want to kind of show now that uh, the tunneling uh, uh, probability, if I take a semiconductor and uh, let's say I have created a situation which looks something like this. Yeah. So I have valence band, conduction band, and these states are filled. All right. And I have, uh, uh, you know, my Fermi level, and the n type is there. Uh, let's say, you know, it's kind of close to degenerate, very close to the valence band, and, and the uh, p side is there, n side is roughly here. This is a p-n junction. And I'm trying to, uh, I've applied a certain voltage, and the voltage is this q times v. You know, that's the voltage I've applied, and I'm trying to tunnel electrons from the valence band here, remember these states are completely filled. Uh, I'm trying to tunnel them out into the conduction band there. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and uh, so, <coughs> so we can, uh, um, uh, j just to kind of also uh, relate to the problem earlier that you have done in your last assignment, for example, you're looking at the Schottky barrier, right? Where you had, uh, you know, uh, electrons uh, so Fermi level here, and you had electrons that were trying to go from here to there, right? Now, whenever you actually measure the Schottky diode, uh, the expression that you got, you know, J is J naught, e to the power QV by KT minus one, that's very close to accurate, but there's always a little more, right? There's always a little more when you experimentally measure it. And the reason for that is we did it in a, we assumed that electrons that have energies lower than the barrier are not gonna go through. But because of tunneling, there's a finite probability that they will also, some of them will, a fraction of them will make through. It's exponentially smaller than the ones that are going through over the barrier, but it, there is, it's there, right? And, and then, uh, so, so some of them will incident here, but you know, instead of being reflected, they will tunnel through. You know? And uh, uh, in fact, we make use of that to make ohmic contacts. When we cannot avoid a barrier, what we do is we kind of dope it very, very heavily here, and so you're, your barrier looks like this, it's extremely thin, and you can tunnel through it, you know, so, so that's, that's a technique that's used heavily. Okay, so uh, if you want to uh, get a, an idea of how much current will flow, if I move from here to there, let's first look at what's the probability of uh, tunneling, and then uh, uh, the way I'm going to think about uh, that is, 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 is uh, similar to what I've asked you in the, uh, in the homework problem. What I want to find first is, uh, Here's the strategy. I'm going to find out what is the probability that an electron that's incident at this point, for example, or at that point, wherever, will make it through to the other side. That's a probability, much, much smaller than one, typically. Uh, 
because it's e to the power minus some number like that, right? e to the power minus square root of that area. Like that's what we're after, right? So uh, then I'm going to find how often is an electron, you know, uh, hitting this wall here. What's the frequency at which it's hitting the wall? Does that make sense? So, so frequency so I, I, uh, of incidence, let's call it gamma inc. You know, gamma is the rate at which in, 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 in omega hertz, gigahertz, whatever, how fast, uh, you know, how often are electrons hitting there? And if they're hitting at that frequency and the probability so, uh, of, of escape is this, then the, you know, uh, uh, frequency at which electrons will move out onto the other side is, is basically equal to incidence frequency times the WKB. You can, see, right? Right, uh, what frequency are they coming out? is a fraction of what in frequency there is, and what fraction? It is the, this fraction, right? Only, only, you know, one out of a hundred, one out of a million comes out, right? So, so. But, you know, every second there may be a billion hitting this, so you've got to multiply the two, right? Does it make sense? And therefore the current, the total current I, this is very nice. You know, once you know the frequency at which electrons are coming out, what is the current? It's electron charge times the frequency, right? because each electron carries with it a certain charge and current is basically charge times the rate at which the, it was moves, right? So it's very simple in that sense. So that's how, think about the tunneling current, for example, right? Uh, and uh, uh, in your, uh, uh, in the homework problem, I don't ask you to go from here to there, but you know, you just need to do this, the frequency, and find out inverse frequencies that lifetime, you know, how long will it take, so, okay. so. Um, uh, if we now look at uh, the, this problem, uh, let's just you know, first look at WKB, how do we calculate that? So the barrier that an electron that's incident from this side as a wave uh, uh, sees is what? What's the barrier that the electron is seeing? So remember, this energy is allowed, and then this is not allowed, that's not allowed, that's, these are all the band gap, right? And then the next energy that's allowed is here, right? So what's the barrier? It's just the band gap, right? E G, the band gap. So that's the barrier height. That's your V, you know, that we are talking about. That's the barrier height. Oh, uh, rather, you know, this barrier. Right now. So that's just a E G. And I drew it like a, in a curved fashion, but let's you know simplify it further. Just make it like a straight. This is called a P I N diode instead of P N diode. That's fine. So make it a kind of a flat, uh, linear drop rather than a curvature right there. So that's EG, and, but EG is not constant. As it moves along a little bit x here, you can see EG is decreasing, 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 and goes to zero, right? So it's a triangular barrier in this picture, right? Not, not a uniform potential barrier, but uh, you know, a triangular barrier which looks uh, like this. Uh, and the height on the left side is EG, and uh, uh, and then it's zero, so it's basically EG minus something times X, and that something happens to be what? The electric field. The electric field is the rate at which the potential changes, right? F is the electric field, Q is electron charge. Q F times X is equal to your V of X. Does that make sense? If I have a field here of F, and that's the slope of the bands, dV by dx, or d is equal to the electric field. Okay, so now, uh, uh, for, for, uh, and, and this is with respect to this energy base that we have assumed, that's basically your zero of the energy. Th does that make sense? That's the base, base of your, uh, with, with respect to that. And therefore the tunneling probability now uh, will be e to the power minus two times an integral of A to B. Right, you go from electron incident here that's the barrier height, and it's a triangular barrier from A to B. A for us, let's choose it to be zero. You, you, you decide what you know uh, that it's easier. Then the uh, what will be B? The length is actually kind of determined already. When V of x goes to zero, you can see the length x would be just E g over Q times f, right? It's a linear drop, very simple, right? So so you are integrating from zero to the gap over Q times the electric field, dx square root of twice the mass over Planck's constant, 
e g minus q f x. That's, that's really the integral. And you can evaluate it. This is exactly doable. Uh, uh, you know, it's just uh, essentially square root of x integral. And uh, when you do that, what you get here, uh, you know, some factors and all that, but uh, more importantly, you get the mass eg to the power 3 halves over electron charge, Planck's constant, and electric field. And that's um, what you're going to do. Isn't, the barrier, isn't that supposed to be dx minus e? Yes, so e is zero here because, yeah, right, exactly. So it is vx minus e, but we are looking at that e, you know, the e at which, uh, if, if e was different, if e was like here and we're looking at this barrier, then you, you must consider that, right? We are looking at this energy here. And uh, what we're going to do is, uh, if I want to see at this energy again, I will go in here and I'll set the e to zero, but the gap will not change. You can see the, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's kind of a little, yeah, okay. Uh, let me just say that you can uh, look at, 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 at that, uh, you know, at that point, there can be electrons that are incident with higher kinetic energy, for which you will have what's called a little damping for electrons that are kind of moving at an angle instead of perpendicular. I'm not getting into so much, so much detail at this point. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a very interesting, uh, and, and in, 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 instead of a free electron mass, if your electrons are going in, say, the valence band here or in the conduction band, you must actually include the effective mass, which is the curvature of the bands, you know, because it's not, in free, it's not a free electron. So, it's, so. so I'm, I'm just kind of rearranging re all this stuff. And uh, the other thing you notice is uh, all this stuff sitting in the front of that exponential, uh, so th what you have here is denominator, this is an electric field, this you can control externally is electric field or, you know, voltage and all that. And everything sitting here must have dimensions of what? E to the power minus something over electric field. So that must have dimensions of what? Also electric field, right? So this is a characteristic electric field, E to the power minus, let's call it F0 over F. Okay? So F0 is depends on the band gap and the effective mass and Planck's constant. You can see this is genuine quantum mechanical phenomenon because this Planck's constant on, uh, appears in it. And uh, so there's a factor of the order of unity, and then you have effective mass, eg to the power three halves over, you know, q Planck's constant. And you can evaluate it. Uh, for most semiconductors, uh, there's another very nice thing, the effective mass of, uh, say, the, this kind of a k dot p theory is proportional to the band gap. You know, you can kind of show that, that larger band gap has a larger effective mass and all that. So essentially it becomes, uh, sorry, I think I wrote, uh, there's one error that it's, it's just should be a square root, sorry, square root of mass. All right. Yeah, uh, and you can check the units, it should work out. We'll get an electric field. Effective mass goes uh, proportional to the band gap, so you kind of get another half power of band gap. So kind of, you know, order, uh, it goes as square of the band gap over uh, over nothing, pretty much. I mean, all, everything else is constant, fundamental constants, electron charge and h bar. Right? So, uh, so this is the characteristic field at which you can start tunneling, and it increases as the square of the band gap. And if you take a conventional semiconductor, let's say you know silicon, or uh, and put in eg is 1.1 electron volt and mass is 0.2 m naught, your electric field uh, for tunneling will be off the order of one to ten uh, megavolts per centimeter characteristic field, or 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power you know, 7 volts per centimeter, order of magnitude. So that's, if you are far below that field, you don't have much tunneling currents flowing. But if you are around that field, you'll get quite a bit of tunneling current stuff. It'll start kind of picking up very fast. And if you, uh, okay, so that's the tunneling probability. Now, incidence, uh, is that clear? I mean, that's, uh, so you, you can plug in the numbers now and, and get what should the probability, yeah. So, since it's band-to-band -band tunneling, if we have an indirect band gap, doesn't it also have to change, you know, move horizontally through case yes, space? Yes, it does. This happen? Yes. Does that decrease our tunneling probability? It does decrease it, indeed. I mean, so, uh, there are, uh, for example, if you have indirect band gap, uh, you need, in addition to a k, because you have, you're starting out from a gamma point here, but you emerge at a x point. So you need a little lateral kick, which is given by phonons or other things. So yeah, that depends on phonons as well. So I'm not getting there, getting into that. But uh, 
uh, let me just say that you'll get pretty close even without kind of ne neglecting some of that you won't be too far off with this with this method you, you will have some another factor out here which will be you know maybe take it down with a factor of five or four or something like that but the real order of magnitude is very close okay, okay so uh, now uh, another thing is kind of the frequency of incidence uh, so the, uh, we got this uh, frequency of incidence is is a uh, uh, here, I'm going to um, remind uh, our, uh, let's remind ourselves that this is the valence band, and in the valence band also has a finite bandwidth, right? It has a gap, you know, band edge somewhere down here, and then there's a gap. And uh, if I were to plot the EK diagram at this point, the valence band looks like that. Right, so valence band is curved downwards like that, right? And the electron, when I say the electron is coming along like that and it's incident, uh, it's really the electron is kind of climbing up here and then it reaches topmost point is here, and then you know, it goes. If it goes back, if, if you might, I mean, it, it's going this way and then it goes back. Basically, electron comes up with a velocity going to the right, slows down, goes zero, and then goes back. Right? But there's a finite probability it will make a jump to the higher state, which is over there. Right? And so the question we're asking is, how long? What is the frequency at which it kind of reaches the top of this hill? Right? If I'm sitting here and I've applied an electric field F, how often will I see that electron go through there? Right? And that should be easy. right? How do I do that? Uh, I know my field. right? If I know my electric field, I can write down the equation of motion in, in k space is very simple, right? It's h bar dk dt, right? If I have electric field, and how much is k changing by? It's going across the balloon zone, minus pi by a to plus pi by a, right? Right, in every period, it's changing by 2 pi by a. You see that? I mean, so, so every period, it'll change by 2 pi by a, and therefore, I write it as h bar times delta k is 2 pi by a in every period divided by the time it takes is the time period of oscillation, right? Now, let me just say, this is not the most accurate way of doing it, but it comes pretty damn close to the right answer. You know? So it's very interesting to get this going in that way. And it conceptually kind of is very interesting too that you can get that that way. So basically what it means is 1 over t, which is the frequency of incidence, the gamma incidence, is 1 over t. And you can see that's q times the force, uh, the electric field of, times the lattice constant a over 2 pi h bar. That's, that's the incidence frequency. And you can multiply the two. Right? And then the higher is the f field, larger is the incidence frequency. And uh, OK, so we can kind of multiply the two here and get your frequency of escape, for example. For your assignment problem, let me just also make sure we're clear. Uh, in the assignment problem, you don't have a band. You kind of have one electron sitting at a certain kinetic energy. And to think of it classically, you can think of it as an electron that has kinetic energy is going, you know, if it's a bound state, it's kind of going back and forth between two walls. And uh, uh, you can get an estimate of what is the velocity and, what's, uh, and from the distance in which it's confined, you can find out that if you know the velocity and distance, you should get a time out of it, right? So frequency oscillation. Yeah. So uh, if uh, now the total current here will be you take this energy, then take this energy, this energy. Oh, you can see there's a window of energies that can turn through, you know. So you you kind of sum them all over these slices over this whole window here. You just sum these things over this whole window, and get the net current from here. And so uh, I can write down the expression if I, when you do that. Uh, so the net tunneling current density here uh, would be uh, obviously you'll have your e to the power minus. 2 root 2, all this stuff, m star, gap 3 halves, h bar. And then you will have your you know, incidence frequency, etc. They'll kind of uh, come in here together, and uh, it will give you kind of a nice, uh, there'll be a quantum of conductance that will appear here. You can see there's a h and a q, and that q will give you a q squared by h. 
that will appear as a quantum conductance. And then, then you will have a, a certain factor here. This is of the order of the valence band density of states times the lattice constant. You know, it's kind of nicely splits into all these quantities here. Anyway, so the, when you multiply, that's what you're going to get. And, and uh, if I now, uh, uh, yeah, that's a question. Um, shouldn't it depend on the voltage? Oh, yeah, of course. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Yeah, now, that's an interesting question. In fact, there is a little voltage built in there, too. But uh, in, in this picture that I showed you, this field is completely determined. I mean, let me say, say it's, uh, let's say this is about you know, 1.1 megavolt per centimeter. This voltage offers very little to the net electric field in a PN diode. It offers a little bit, but not much at all. What the voltage really does is it opens up the window over which tunneling can occur. You know, that's really what it does most of the time. But it has an effect on the tunneling probability too. It adds to the field a little bit. But that effect is very weak. You know. But opening up the window is kind of the thing, which is why if it has an effect on opening the window, it appears here. Whereas uh, uh, you know, the slight voltage dependence will appear inside this as F plus a little very small factor times that voltage. So it'll appear that. So. Right, yeah. For our linear potential, how do we calculate the effective mass? Because it'd be if if we use the original formula, formula, wouldn't it be either infinity everywhere because we don't have a curvature, or it'd be zero at the places where? Uh, say that again for the linear potential. Linear potential where we were approximating it, like the triangle. Uh huh. You, you mean this? Mass one? is dependent on the curvature, but then we don't have a curvature. All right. Now you're you're asking uh, you're poking into a more deeper question here. What is the effective mass when the electron is going through the gap, right? Yeah. Um, now that's, uh, let me just tell you what people use, but, and then I'll tell you how, how one can do better. You know. What people use is, uh, uh, you can see the electron enters with a certain effective mass of the valence band. But it emerges with the effective mass of the conduction band. So uh, if you do the kind of uh, analysis of WKB here, uh, there are various options. You know. You get MC, MV, a geometric mean. You get average. All these potential uh, you know, potential situations. But the uh, and uh, so most of the times uh, the lighter. Uh, uh, but but actually, what what uh, this is a very important uh, uh, approximation. That if you ask me that I give you a problem and I ask you how how should I uh, approach it, you should take the inverse sum. You know, and that uh, that is uh, that is actually. Uh, um, given by uh, the way it appears in in, 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 in the you know tunneling integral and the tunneling current expression, so if you want to do, but uh, to make it very accurate, so let me just say that this is a more preferred way of uh, calculating the tunneling current as what effective tunneling mass should I use? But physically, what it's doing is you know it's uh, k is becoming the wave vector k is becoming imaginary, right? Which is why the bar i k x becomes real. Right? So, or, or, you know, um, what the electron really does is uh, what we call imaginary k. It doesn't care. Right? It has no problem going into the imaginary space, right? It's it's imaginary for us, but the electron doesn't care, right? So it, it will it really goes into the imaginary k space and it comes back, you know, uh, into, into the real space. And uh, it's not, you know, nothing uh, shouldn't be very troubling because light does it all the time. You have a waveguide, part of the light lives outside the wave. That's the imaginary part. We call it imaginary, but it's, you know, as real as light can be, right? Uh, so uh, mathematically, it looks imaginary. And so, on. so it goes out in the imaginary space. So what you actually, the most exact way of doing it is you do a path integral outside in the imaginary case space all over that space and come back here. You know, so, so for the electron, as far as that goes, it, it, you know, it's just a barrier. And therefore, the k must go imaginary. So it goes imaginary and comes back. You evaluate path integral. And this question of what mass should I take will not occur, because at every point, there's a well-defined mass then, even in the imaginary case. Yeah. OK, so uh, those are. So uh, let me uh, just show a couple of things here before I move on. Uh, uh, the, so, so we talked about how roughly to get an idea of uh, what sort of tunneling current can I get, and I'm saying you know, this is, gives you a reasonable expression, uh, and, and come, gets you close to uh, what we might actually measure, and and uh, 
Oh, sorry. Yeah, here's the picture again of uh, uh, this whole thing. Uh, calculate the tunneling probability, find out the incidence frequency, and then uh, go through uh, this expression, escape frequency and current. Now, uh, now if I take it and apply it to, say, gallium arsenide. Gallium arsenide has a gap of about 1.4 electron volts, e.g. And the mass is, you know, if I take, uh, you know, among the choices, if I take the 1 over m star plus 1 over m star v, the lighter one will dominate completely. You know, lighter mass will dominate completely. So you can plug in the values for gallium arsenide for mass and, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, calculate this whole quantity. And you will get the current density. For example, if I have one megavolt per centimeter uh, of uh, my electric field, my current den density is about one microamp per centimeter square. You know. It's extremely low. Uh, uh, a metal, for example, you can easily push at a small voltage uh, about a, you know, uh, hundreds of kiloamp per centimeter square or maybe even a megaamp per centimeter square. So uh, this is a very, very low current density. Uh, and, and that's good because you, know, you want the gap of the semiconductor to provo avoid electrons you know, going, going across right, for many applications. But when you want the electrons to go through, you can't do it with one megavolt per centimeter. You must go to maybe two or three megavolt per centimeter, and then you get up to about 100 amp per centimeter square. Right? Uh, as a you know, kind of a order of magnitude, uh, if you're doing solar cells, uh, the current that flows in a solar cell is about milliamp per centimeter square. So you must be at least kind of around here. And so in gallium arsenide, the highest efficiency solar cells are today pushing close to 39% efficiency you know, from light to heat. And so they use uh, three junctions, three PN junctions, and each of them has a tunnel barrier. Uh, you know, just like we talked about, you have a tunnel junction in between connecting three. And there you must uh, make the tunnel junction such that it can e flow across it you know, easily about a few milliamps per centimeter square of current, or if not higher, uh, maybe you know even amp per centimeter square with very little voltage. You know, so 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 therefore they are very heavily doped, and uh, uh, you know the internal electric field, this field, is made very very high, so that you can kind of get that high current. Uh, so uh, as opposed to, uh, and then you if you look at a gallium arsenide laser, sometimes you have buried tunnel junction lasers (BTJs). I mean, where uh, the laser needs a current of typically you know, about a 10 kiloamp per centimeter square. So we are kind of talking about here. That's how much current should flow through a laser before it starts lasing. You need to inject that much current. That's a threshold, sort of. Actually, gallium arsenide has gotten very good recently, so maybe about 100. And then you, you can see you must have an internal field of this much. And that will kind of determine your doping. How much doping should I put into the semiconductor? Yeah. OK, okay so uh, uh, I, 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 I will actually. Uh, not talk any further about tunneling. This should be hopefully enough. But uh, if there is interest, uh, uh, I have uh, time uh, quite a bit later in the course for you know if you want to you know go into more deeper into any subject, we can go there. But that's all I wanted to talk about tunneling. So, any further questions on that? Yeah. Uh, because uh, the tunneling current, uh, so, so you are saying, uh, why don't we use tunneling? So both of them occur. You have thermionic emission, which is kind of the classical current that flows. And you also have current that goes under the barrier. Uh, actually, that's a great question. So let me just say that uh, tunneling is, uh, is, is uh, the word, it, I mean, the, 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 is, is really uh, meant for when the electron energy Kinetic energy says that uh, there's a potential barrier that's taller than it. So, so if, if the kinetic energy is larger than the barrier height, then it's just kind of a standard transmission. Uh, you know, it's a classical wave transmission across, uh, across a barrier. And that's the uh, short key barrier problem, which uh, we, you solved earlier. What I wanted to say is you do have the tunneling current flowing in parallel to it. You know? So you'll, you'll have to sum the conductances because of both processes. You have to sum it. And, uh, in fact, you, you, if you want to become, uh, think of it in a much more general way, you may say that I don't even want to think of you know, the two methods. I don't want to go you know, think about tunneling and transmission separately. You can do that too. You can essentially go with your, uh, um, he, he, here's a way to calculate the current then. You know? So we had current 
written earlier as Q times you know, all the degeneracies, and then uh, uh, you're kind of summing over the group velocities, right? And then there's a mod psi squared, which gives you like a L here, and occupation function. Here, when I write this expression, my assumption is there's no barrier in the path of the electron. That, that's the assumption. The moment I have a barrier, I must add one more factor. That is, what is the transmission probability for that electron to go from the left to right? And if there's a barrier, I must add this thing here. So this is a revised and expanded expression for current density that you must add in your prob transmission probability. You know? And if you have a barrier like this, that happens to be the WKB sort of turning probability. So you can think of it in this way. Your transmission is basically close to 1 uh, above the barrier, and it decays very sharply below that. You know? So if I were to plot that uh, as a function of energy instead of k, and I'm plotting my transmission function here, then uh, you know, if I have energies above that, I'm kind of going very close to 1. So energy converted to k here. Right? But then when I go under the barrier, what you have solved earlier is a unit step. The transmission probability is 1 above it, and it's 0 below. Right? What I'm saying is when you add on the tunneling, there is a little tail that kind of will do that. Right? that, that, that you know, so, 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 so. Uh, in fact, uh, what is the most weird thing about it is if I add two barriers, uh, it will, uh, you know, it, it, it can actually have uh, this resonance state I was mentioning. So if I have only one barrier, this will always decay. But if I have two barriers, it can, you know, go down, but it comes back up again like that once. It's a very weird thing because electrons are waves. Uh, they can have this fabry pierrot effect. So two barriers will offer you less resistance than one barrier. You know, and then that's very much possible. And I showed you data earlier, okay, the resonant peaks and all that. Yeah. So you mentioned that the characteristic field strength is on the order of megavolts. Yeah. Um, per centimeter. Per centimeter. Yeah, field. Yeah. Does that mean that there could be electrical breakdown? Yes. Time? Exactly. So uh, in fact, the tunneling, uh, this is called Zener tunneling, interband tunneling, uh, where you go from valence band to conduction band. Zener tunneling and Clarence Zener, who first developed it, was trying to explain why do so in insulators break down when you apply a very large field. You know? And that was his way of thinking that I'm pulling out electrons from the valence band. And uh, so this is one mechanism also for breakdown. You know? But what happens with, electro uh, with typical semiconductors is there are other me mechanisms that kick in before the Zener breakdown can occur. You know? uh, so like, there's something called an avalanche process where, uh, yeah, so uh, avalanche kicks in before Zener tunneling. But in some semiconductors, you can design it such that it will break down using this mechanism. You know, basically. So in a way, you can also think of it as, your, you know, if you want to picture it to atoms, atoms have bound states of electrons, right? And then vacuum that has you know, uh, no electrons. And you put an atom, a hydrogen atom, a nitrogen atom in a very high electric field, you will pull that electron out sooner or later at a certain field, right? And in the same way, valence band is holding electrons. What's stopping it from getting to the conduction band is the gap, right? But if your field strength is large enough, you can you know, basically ionize it. Essentially, it's kind of ionizing the valence band. And when, you, when the electron emerges on this side, what is left beh behind is a hole. So you create N here, and you create P here. Right? So and the electron moves that way, the hole goes that way now. So, so, right? so mm, yeah. <clears throat> OK, so uh, I wanted to move to the next topic, which is uh, 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 essentially, we are moving towards nanostructures and heterostructures now, where we have quantum wells or wires or dots. And I want to talk about uh, how would one uh, start thinking about uh, you know, quantized heterostructures uh, um, and, 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 and apply all the things we have talked about uh, till now. Wait, where am I here? Sorry, um, slide sort of. Mm, it's so slow here. Okay, it's 
right, very close, yeah. Um, so uh, just to kind of uh, calibrate where are we on the side. So essentially we're going to do uh, something called the effective mass theorem now, which is uh, you know, saying that if you have any kind of nanostructure, quantum wires, wells, dots, uh, uh, point defects, impurities, donors, how do you handle it uh, given that the only thing we have really solved till now is the electron in a perfectly periodic crystal, right? But all these things, a donor atom, is a perturbation to that. It's a you know, tweak to that. If you put a quantum well, it's not completely periodic in one direction. You have broken some periodicity now, right? So how do you handle that? Uh, it seems like a very big problem to solve, but uh, you know, this, this effective mass method makes it uh, the most simple problem of, you know, uh, basically uh, uh, it, it maps this kind of complicated problem of an electron moving through a crystal and seeing some defects and all that, uh, or, or quantum wells or quantization and changes it into a, uh, uh, you know, exactly, pretty much exactly solved problem. It was done by, you know, Walter Cohn, one year, and Lottinger and others. Uh, so start looking at these slides, and I will essentially give you the basic idea of the, what is the effective mass theorem, and how, why is it so powerful to deal with nanostructures. Right. So that's what we want to talk about today and uh, again the next class. Okay. So, um, uh, so he, here are the slides, so starting handout 24 and, you know, the following those. Right. So I'll, I'll uh, um, start with that, and uh, that's that's our next topic: effective uh, mass theorem, or in general, I'll just call it uh, methods. You know, these are uh, how how do, uh, to deal with uh, uh, w uh, why are we explain uh, developing it. We want to explain how donors look, or donors and acceptors look, how. Uh, quantized heterostructures, you know, quantum wells, wires, dots. Uh, you know, these are different dimensions, right? Three dimensions, uh, sorry, two dimensions, confinement, and one dimensional confinement, and zero dimensional confinement, and so on, right? And uh, uh, what we are also doing right now is preparing for the next topic, which is uh, photonics. and. Uh, uh, quantum well design and uh, light emission, how do you design those things? So a lot of these uh, photonic uh, uh, nanostructures, uh, for, uh, you know, photonic device structures like lasers and LEDs and quantum cascades uh, make heavy use of uh, the effective mass methods. Uh, okay, so what is the effective mass method? Um, so here, here's uh, the outline of the problem. We have spent a great deal of time now in, in developing the following problem, that I have the conduction band of a semiconductor, I have a valence band of semiconductor, we spend you know, a large amount of time explaining why is there a gap, right? Because the electron wave starts interfering with the crystal wave and there's Bragg reflection, if you might, and there's a gap. And the energies that were initially completely allowed in this window for a free electron are not allowed anymore. And they get you know, redistributed and you have a valence band with states here and conduction band with states there. And in the EK diagram, what we realize is there's a picture which would look like, you know, here's a conduction band where it, it would look like EC, which is the band edge, plus H square, K square by twice mass, right? Effective mass now. Not the full mass, but the effective, not, not the free electron mass, but the effective mass. And then similarly, for valence band, I can write it as E sub C here. Valence band dispersion will be E V minus, it's curving downwards, right? H square by twice the valence band effective mass times K squared. Right? So, so that's your full, you know, sort of a band diagram picture and band structure picture too. So, so. Uh, now microscopically what's going on though is if I zoom in into that, you know, this, this can be maybe I'm looking at say a micron here, right? When I zoom in, I see, when I zoom in very, very far, I see there's a, you know, lattice of atoms, right? And, and, and basis and all that, right? And all that. And uh, so what is the, uh, uh, what are the wave functions for the electrons in, in this situation, right? Uh, the wave functions allowed for a perfect crystal are the block functions, right? So, so e to the power i kx, which would be the completely free electron. But then, because it's in a crystal, you have this little modulating function, which is periodic with the lattice, right? right. So, so you have this picture where uh, you know, the wave function uh, is being modulated by a certain crystal potential 
you know, and essentially this thing is x plus a is equal to u k of x. It's periodic with the crystal. So, now, uh, and as an example, uh, these 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 uh, could be all silicon atoms, or you know, gallium and arsenic, and gallium and arsenic, and so on. And so the wave function, uh, uh, you know, for every unit, this u k. The periodic repeat will look maybe, I know, some sort of a complex, uh, I want to maybe just, let's just simple, you know, it'll maybe look like a s orbital, for example, right? or some, some other orbital, but whatever be it, it's going to just repeat at right, every unit cell. Uh, and, and, uh, and this function, on the other hand, is a very slowly varying function. It's kind of, you know, going like that. It's a e to the pi kx. It depends on the k, right? If k is close to zero, this is flat. If k becomes slightly larger, it starts kind of curving, but it's, it, it, it is not periodic with the unit cell. You know, right? k is not periodic with the unit cell. It's, it's much more long range uh, variation. So the product of that is going you know, like that, like that, and, right? So that's the total wave function, that's the block function. Now, when I take the block function and I, and I uh, say that uh, I have the crystal periodic potential and I act on the block function, psi k, what do I get here? Uh, the, the periodic crystal potential, when you, when you, uh, you know, have the Hamiltonian act on that with the block function, plus the periodic potential, right? That's your Hamiltonian. When you get the EK diagram, the, the dispersion, right? That's, that's how you get this. Okay. E of k. In fact, you will get all conduction valence, everything. In, in, if you change your k's, you will get multiple bands and all that. So, uh, and and I just wanted to also show uh, one. Uh, uh, I think you, you know, just, just want to share. Uh, you can you can simulate it and and show uh, show show this. Uh, how how does it actually evolve with k? And uh, uh, because for the effective mass, that that sort of a, a it's, it's, it's nice to be able to visualize a little bit if we can. Wait, where is the effective mass equation? There you go, yeah. Okay, so, you know, hopefully you can see, maybe I increase the size a little bit here. So what I'm plotting here, I'm plotting when k is very close to zero, I'm plotting e to the power i kx, uh, k is very small, and the red part is your block function, you know, product of the of the e to the power i k x and the uh, 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 no sorry uh, so the blue part is is the product of a periodic part which is u k you know the and, and the red red is the e to the power i k x right? so the blue is the product and I, I, as you ch start getting giving the electron more and more kinetic energy you know you start from k is equal to zero and you start climbing the function starts oscillate in you know, oscillating further and, and and you know you will Essentially, it will do that, right? So, so essentially, you can see that it will. Uh, here's your UK, and, and the e to the power i k x now becomes like that. This is just real part. It's actually uh, a real part of it. But in, uh, this is your block function now, the blue part. This is a really block function, and you can see it's not periodic with the crystal. But well, the effective mass theorem, what it really does, is gives you a method to get rid of the periodic, uh, you know, the the, uh, the microscopic variation. And it will tell you that you can do amazingly large amount of things by just looking at the red curve, which is the, you know, what do you call the envelope function here. This is the envelope function that kind of going, you know, around the, uh, uh, the, the microscopic the oscillating function. You know. So that it will get rid of that uh, uh, u of k uh, completely uh, uh, under certain approximations. And why is it important? For a bulk material, it's completely unimportant. But the moment I have some variations, like I have a quantum well, for example, if I have a quantum well, what happens now is the electrons get trapped inside. There's bound states inside it, right? And uh, uh, now, if I have a, you know, if, if I have a situation where the conduction band profile looks like this, again, microscopically, you have all these, you know, atoms, slightly different kind of atoms, which has a smaller band gap. Then again, all atoms. So microscopically, if I have, uh, you know, uh, electrons at this energy, for example, this is the energy then that electron inside here will be trapped. It cannot get out, right? So now it's, it doesn't have a full block function. You can see that because it's you know, trapped here. It's not going through the whole crystal now, right? 
So, so, so how do you deal with that? Uh, and, and the effective mass theorem, so for example, I'm plotting that picture again. That if I have a quantum well, and I'm looking at, again, the total wave function, the blue is the total wave function, but the red is the envelope function. And the envelope function will give you the entire answer for many things. You don't have to bother about the, you know, microscopically. So if I make the well wider, the envelope function looks like that, when, you know, the block function is still doing its periodic oscillations, right? Uh, Right, and, uh, and then uh, as we l we'll look at you know, uh, smaller and smaller structures, nanostructures, uh, I, I don't know, it, I don't think the red and the blue look the same, but I, let me just say that you can get a lot of information about the system, like transport, bound states, and all that, without looking at the blue, but just looking at the red. You know? And the red part is what you get by the effective mass theorem. You, you, it will give you a method to calculate it. You know? And what we'll see is, really there's no more calculation left because the, what it'll do is it'll take the problem of the per periodic crystal with all these variations like quantum wells or donors and it'll map it to an exactly solved problem like a free electron or a hydrogen atom or something like that. It'll map it to that problem and you already have the solutions for those. You don't have to redo the problem completely. You know, so, so uh, and I'll just outline very briefly the method. Uh, we don't have much time, maybe a few minutes, but uh, I'll, I'll, I kind of, uh, uh, that, that's kind of the motivation, uh, but uh, the method uh, we will uh, start discussing in greater detail in the next class and immediately apply it to wells and dots and all that. Uh, so the method goes uh, basically like this, that, uh, that here's the idea. The idea is most of the action in a semiconductor happens right at the bottom of the conduction band or at the top of the valence band. So I'm really kind of doing much of a, a lot of overkill by including all these other k states. I don't need them really for most of the action, most of the things I'm interested in. I don't really kind of typically need them. So uh, what we can do is instead of trying to write the wave function in its all its general, generality, which is e to the power i k x, u k x, right? Uh, what we're going to do is take a very small set of k's which is at the bottom or the minimum of a band, for example, or maximum of a valence band, a very small set of k's. And then I'll form, this is a complete wave uh, of a unique k, right? This is a unique k, which, uh, let me sketch it here. Okay. So, I'm gonna, so I'm looking at maybe this k, for example. That's, that's a, a wave function of that state, right? Exact wave function, the block state. But, but what I'm going to do is not consider that state, but I'll consider a superposition of a few states with certain coefficients ck near it. You know. so a small set of k's, not all k's, but so I'll consider maybe this one, this one, this one, this one. And then I can choose, this is e of k. So I can choose what weights I desire, you know, what, what c of k's I want. Right. And I'll weight the maybe the minimum with the highest C of k, maybe you know, something like that, a high, st high value. So I'm, I'm plotting like C of k here. And this one may be very small, this one a little smaller. Uh, right? So these are my C of k. Right? So I'm just constructing a state which looks, you know, these C of k's kind of look like that. It's kind of a very sharp function. M most of the weight is at the center, at the minimum point. You know? And, and uh, uh, the only thing I need to ensure, because it's uh, you know, one state, uh, it's a quantum mechanical state that's decomposed into very, is, is the sum is one. So this is basically saying you're still normalized. Mod psi squared is still one. The integral is still one. So now with that, uh, the, uh, so what is this called? Maybe some of you know, so when you create this, instead of one wave, unique wavelength, there is a little range of them. So, yeah, yeah, the method is superposition, and what we have created is not a block wave anymore but it's a wave packet. It has you know, some k's. It's not a unique k. It has a range of k's. Uh, it's delta k. Okay. And if I do that, a block wave is delocalized over the entire crystal. The block wave lives over the whole crystal. You can't say, oh, the electron is in this 2 nanometers or it's in that 5 nanometers. It's in the whole crystal, the block wave, because mod psi square is periodic. And there's no, you know, if you take the block wave, it's periodic, and there's no change from one lattice to another. It kind of repeats on and on, right? But the wave packet, you can localize into five nanometers, right? And how do you do that? Basically, you can, we'll see right away that if you choose a small set of k's here, the delta k leads to a delta x in real space, the extent of that wave function, right? 
and the product is of the order of 1. Delta k times delta x is roughly 1. So if I choose maybe a very large range of k's, I'll get a very small delta x. I can have a confined structure where electron I can now say that it's limited to this 5 nanometers or 4 nanometers. So, and, and, so okay, this is the method. Uh, to, so we'll start with saying that I'm going to create a wave packet because I want to now look at what happens for an electron that is brought about by a donor that is a foreign atom on a, on a crystal or an acceptor or a quantum well. And what we'll see, uh, 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 okay, so this is the wave packet. It's a method of creating the wave packet. And then the, with a couple of steps with, from here, what we'll be able to do is rewrite the whole you know, uh, electron in a crystal problem uh, in this way. So here's your periodic potential times psi k is block functions times uh, block, uh, you know, exact energies uh, times uh, psi k. That's your exact solution. But now I'm saying I'm going to introduce maybe a donor atom which has a slightly different potential. It's a perturbation, it's a change from the periodic potential. Right? A donor atom would be, this is positively charged, and then the potential now looks like that. It's an attractive potential for electrons now. Right? EC of x, if I put a donor here, EC of x is perturbed. Right? So uh, what I'll do then is I want to find the new energies that are allowed for that state and, and uh, the new wave functions that are allowed for this state. And the claim is this wave function is the effective mass wave function. That's what we're going to show. And we'll do that in the next class. Then. Uh, so this is a method. We're going to deal with wave packets. And we will introduce a method that no matter what change you introduce to the periodic crystal, you can handle it now. Right? Be it uh, you know, some sort of a narrow band gap material or a quantum dot, you can handle it now. Yeah. Is W the perturbation of the uh, uh, This is any general perturbation, meaning anything that breaks the anything that is a change to the fact that there's one infinitely large crystal. Uh, so if you have a quantum well in that direction, for example, the atoms are different now, right, in, in a certain region. The band edges are different. So what I'm saying is your conduction band, if it is like that, if it is like that, if it is like that, all of them will be solved. And basically, what is W? It is, if it was flat, W is 0. W is the change. Any change is the W. So that, that's what effective mass theorem will give us. Yeah. Okay, good. we meet uh, on Tuesday. And uh, office hours uh, tomorrow, 5 to 6.30.